Hello, it's me again. Um, I have this nervous tick, don't know that I do this every time I come on. Um, so listen, I've been meaning to this for a while and we're past the holidays now, so I thought this would be pretty good. And the title of this video, as I put on the header there, was um, a passion for books. But what's the point? Um, and I've been meaning to this for a while because some said to me a couple of months ago, um, you know, kind of really like what you do, but what's the point of it? And that was a really interesting question because <laughs> I suppose that, um, you know, like I know why I like studying books and that I like um, talking about books and that kind of thing, but I don't suppose I'd explained that. We well, certainly hadn't explained it to the person I was talking to. Um, and I, it got me thinking more generally about, you know, what I do and what people presume it is, I suppose, or why, what people kind of think that it's about um, and I you know I'm kind of going through a bit of a change of perspective I suppose over the last few months and it's it really made me think of what it must look like from the outside um, when I talk about literature and I talk about novels and I talk about fiction and all of those things and I talk about my classes especially um, you know coming to study um, literature coming to study novels and I thought about that from the outside um, you know, try to get a different perspective on it. And, you know, I thought, wow, <laughs> it must look, maybe it looks different to what I know it to be. You know what I mean? Maybe it looks, um, you know, I've always kind of struggled to get people to come to class. Uh, when people do come to class, it's, it's always really good and they, and they generally come back. But um, getting people to actually, you know, understand that it's very accessible and it's not something highbrow has been quite difficult. So... In the spirit of all of that, and with, you know, you know, I, I, every t everything, the way I see things is every potential action, every potential event is something you can learn from. I really feel that. I've always kind of felt that in my heart, but I've had so much thinking going on in the past that I couldn't really see it. Um, there were times in classes, like um, classes that I've done in the past where I've, you know, um, the class has been so vibrant and so just philosophically dynamic, <laughs> if you like, that, you know, I've said, wow, you do you realize we could, we could, we could find interest in a glass of water. You know what I mean? We, we could, we could think about, um, a glass of water and actually have something interesting to discuss because, you know, that's it. It's, it's, it's life. Everything's life and everything's potentially something, um, that you can learn from, whether it's just a shift of perspective or it's something genuinely that you didn't know before. Um, I, wow, I'm so embracing that. I've always, as I say, I've always felt that, but I really feel it now. And, uh, you know, that question that was put to me could have, yeah, I suppose in the past I would have taken it personally. I probably did actually take it a little bit personally at the time, you know, because, um, I suppose implicit in the question is um, kind of what's the point? You're kind of rhetorically saying there isn't really any point to what you do, which is funny, and I get it, and I totally get that. But with that, with the, all of that preamble, I suppose um, for two or three months I've been thinking and working my way to doing this video, which was to to show what I find interesting about studying books and I suppose answering that question what's the point so I made this list <laughs> this is a list of books that I have done in class and I kind of like and um, I made this list to do some videos on I'm going to talk about these books at some point individually but you know what this is why I find I'm passionate about literature. It happened probably in my late teens, um, started reading certain things. I think it was Stephen King originally. And uh, I wanted to write like that. I wanted to write in that kind of, you know, I don't know, exciting way. And that sparked something in me. And, um, you know, I never really looked back from there. I tried different avenues of writing and that kind of thing. Um, I remember the day that I read Hemingway for the first time, I read uh, some of his short stories, um, in uh, a, his one of his first collections called In Our Time, and it blew my mind. <laughs> I'd never read anything like it. It was so real and so just full of 
obviously detail, but full of something beneath the surface that I, I knew was there, but I couldn't quite get. It just, it was a total epiphany about what you could do with writing and how you could just make a connection in terms of how you see the world. Um, uh, you know, and I, I, I mean, it's not because of Hemingway that I did my English degree, but it was one of the spokes along the way. Also, when I first read The Great Gatsby, um, again, it was just the way that Fitzgerald puts language together, just... Uh, you know, to, to shift perspective, to get a different angle on, on life. Now, and this is what it boils down to, to me. So, to, so I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I'm going to attempt to answer that question, what's the point? And the point is, you know, it's, it's a many-spoked wheel, I suppose you could say. <laughs> I'm sorry, I make myself laugh all the time. Um, you know, there's the entertainment value. Books are just cool to read, you know, for entertainment value. There's that, definitely. I, I do get that, but I'm going to just put that aside because that's not really what it is for me. It's, I've always been fascinated about life. I just, I'm fascinated. I grew up in a pub, so this is really important, probably. <laughs> I grew up in a pub listening to different people tell stories. Um, so I have this story, this project going at the moment called Stories of Our Lives, which is just, uh, you know, it's like... You know that 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 storytelling and link to storytelling and expression through stories has been with me right. It's with all of us, but it's been with me right from, through my early life in the pub, listening to people tell their stories, um, and now I'm just having so much fun interviewing people and listening to you know them tell the stories of who they are, which is fantastic. And to be able, it's a total privilege to be able to listen to people tell their stories. But you know this in terms of literature. This is uh, something that, you know, I, as I said before, I kind of developed late in life. And um, the thing for me about it is, you know, from this early age of listening to people talk about their stories, developed a kind of philosophical out, outlook, I suppose, which was, you know, I used to ask questions when I was a kind of teenager of like, why is the world like this? Why do we do this kind of thing? There seemed to be a lot of unhappy, unhappy people. And we seemed to be the only animal that was in control and I couldn't understand why so many people are unhappy. That didn't sit well with me as a kid. I, I couldn't understand that it seemed to be our world, but a lot of people were pissed off. <laughs> I couldn't work that out and it's been an ongoing question for me as well. Um, so I grew up and developed into an adult having so many questions about the world and I just love ideas about... And, and finding out about little idiosyncratic things about the way we live and how we tick and, you know, our interrelationships and our interactions and all of the things that make human life fascinating and rich. And lo and behold, <laughs> you find a lot of those things in novels. Um, you know, writers are... I, I spoke to someone yesterday, we had a chat about literature and, um, you know, all of the writers that we were talking about some of them on this list, it's just people trying to express what they, their view of the world in, in whatever way they see the world. It's just trying to express it through a story. They make characters, they, you know, they have a, 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 some kind of story in their head. Um, they have characters that are maybe based a little bit on themselves. Um, and it's just a way of working out your worldview and within the within that you put in what you know about the world and you know and, and people read it and get excited about it or they don't um I, so i find books an amazing source of um you know ideas and that's the thing for me it's always been about the ideas and when we do classes when i do classes it's always you know we do the stylistic stuff we we do that's not the group um <laughs> I can give you anything. No, it's not that. We do the kind of stylistic stuff where we look at the tone of the writing and all that kind of thing um, and, you know, style and, and all of that. But I'm really interested in the ideas in the books. And I think that through the years, what's happened is I've, it's become what's been really fascinating is the ideas in the books. It used to be all about the ideas in the books. Through the 10 years of doing my own classes, so making my own classes, choosing the books, deciding what to do and shaping it kind of just, you know, f purely through what I like, um, I've become so fascinated with not just the ideas in the books, but the relationship that people have with the ideas in the books. So people bring their own stories to what the book is about 
from their own experiences and from their own beliefs and everything. And then they come and they tell stories about what the book is about. And that is so fascinating to me. It's just why I keep wanting to do classes and why classes have been so exciting for me through the years. And this gradual sliding from just pure academia, you know, looking at the ideas in the books and trying to bring them out to this really nuanced and subtle, you know, and, and really, and I don't want to get too spiritual about it, but it's almost like a witnessing of people telling their stories through the ideas in the books. And that's just become a fascinating thing. And my next series of literature classes is going to be much more owning that and actually directly about that. It's going to be exploring who we are through the ideas in the, ideas in the books and not, not coming out as a byproduct really of what we do in class, but actually directly looking at that. So that's really exciting for me. But so... Again, you know, do not get me too near coffee when I'm doing one of these, which unfortunately I've just had one, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about 100 miles an hour. But all of that kind of like groups into the little snowball of um, ideas being something that I'm fascinated by. And, and the ideas in, in, in fictional works are fascinating. You know, you can get all of the ideas that you talk about, about anything in essays and that kind of thing. Um, but... I don't know, it's just, it tends to be kind of angled in a very certain direction. Um, you come at it in a quite straight way. I find fiction is a fantastic way of approaching certain ideas that we might be very set about. We might have very, you know, strong opinions about certain things. Coming at it through the story, through very skillful writers presenting these ideas through characters is fascinating because you get perspectives that you might never have seen. I, I know a, a, a fantastic lady called Ros Duff Miller, who's don't think she'll mind me saying she's in her 80s but she is a lifelong student this is a, an amazing human being she just never stops trying to learn and she'd studied psychology and philosophy and so many things for years I, I literally heard her behind me in the in a coffee shop one day um, <laughs> talking about some of these things and I turned to her and said look you, you know you have to come to one of my classes because you're just out, so out there and she did and what was fascinating for her you know she did classes with me for years she she was approaching all of the same things she'd studied but from a completely different perspective she was studying them through a living story if you like um fictional living story what does that mean but she was studying through them through these she was studying these ideas through really vibrant characters who were working whatever it was out in their lives and that was a complete revelation to her um you know brings up nuances and perspectives that she'd never really encountered before so um you know that's kind of why I love fiction and literary fiction, especially. I um, don't really want to get bogged down in the difference between kind of popular fiction and literary fiction, but you know, I like books that are going to make me think. There's obviously there's room for storytelling, which is pure storytelling, where you turn the page to find out what's happened next. Brilliant! That's fantastic. Who doesn't love that? But there are books also that are about the human condition, which aren't about necessarily what happens next. They're asking you questions. There might be moral questions, psychological questions, social questions, philosophical questions, spiritual questions, whatever they are. But the books are almost a working out of those ideas and they're not giving you the answers. They're asking you more, they're more asking you questions. You know, they're, they're, they're painting fantastically vivid pictures, but they are very much, they're, 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 there's a curiosity underpinning it, I think. And that's what I love, you know, the, so, take a breath um ideas and you know put into the context of characters um which are brought to life in your mind um so vividly that you're kind of living it so there's ideas this is one reason what's the point a, a fantastic way to look at different ideas through from different angles and different perspectives second thing perspectives i think Studying literature is a fantastic way, and it's not just literature, but it's, it is for me, but you can do this through movies and lots of other media as well. But there's something about reading, I think, which is really fascinating because you have to make it up in your own head. You do have to do more work, I think, when you are reading something and you're putting that world together mentally in your head. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing, I suppose it's in the ballpark of when we see a movie of a book we've read, it's never quite the same because the book's 
in your head and you've created that world in your head and you see it on the screen maybe it's not quite doesn't quite match up which is really interesting um but perspectives are fascinating because you know you can dip into a book you can get into the book so the color purple and you can have the experience um, of a lady you know black lady that you've never you would never have if that's not your experience if you're just a you know if you're you're a white male like me and you kind of get into a head into this person's head and you see her experience and you feel it so raw and it just gives you something that you would never have had without that and I find again I find that fascinating so there's you know again flip back to the beginning of the video where I was talking about everything is a potential to learn every single thing that happens to you is a potential to just you know it's everything is human experience every single thing you know me to picking up these um <laughs> little little earphones here you know it's something that is happening to you it's not an insignificant part of your life we kind of think it is but actually everything's valid everything's potentially out there to think about and to learn from and that's the way i see books as well um you know, every book, people judge books so easily and go, I don't like this book, I don't like this book, this book's for men, this book's for women. You know what? You're closing potentially down a whole avenue of just different perspectives, which you would never have encountered before. And again, that's mind-blowingly fantastic if you think about it. Um, you know, just the just the, the ability to, to pick up a book and step into a world that you will never, ever encounter in the real world until we get virtual reality pods, but let's not talk about that. Um, you know what I mean? You can kind of create that world comes alive to you, a Kafkaesque world where a guy is, um, you know, is suddenly um, on, you know, kind of arrested and he doesn't know why he's arrested and that feeling you know, that word Kafkaesque develops in the 20th century because it kind of relates to something that we start to feel. Bureaucracy is out of control. And that, that, this, that underlying feeling that it, if it goes wrong, you could be really in trouble at any point and you might not know why. Um, we can step into that world and feel it. It's real to us in our heads almost. You know, the power of fiction. Just anecdotally, just a little story here. This is really lovely. I had a lady who was just a, a really warm, lovely human being who was very bright. She used to come to class. She always spoke and just was very engaged in what was going on. And um, we did the novel Atonement, which is, I think, a modern classic. And I really genuinely believe that will be read in 100 years because it's structurally beautiful. And it tells a fantastic story. Um, anyway, and there's a, there's a kind of twist in that book, if you don't know it, where, um, I shouldn't really give it away, but basically the novel you're reading is written by a character in the book. So Atonement by Ian McEwan. It's like, you know, in the world of the book, Atonement's written by Bryony Tallis. And by definition of that, she's made it all up, or she's made lots of it up. So we're talking about this and I see this lady and she's kind of looking, you know, I'm talking about the fact that that's, a, that's an issue in the book. And she's looking at me and looking around. She's totally not getting it. So she says after a while, she's like, and I, I say, and, and I, I clock this and I say, uh, you know, and I think, wow, does she not get it? So I said, you know, of course, Brian is making it up. At one point I just said that out, you know, out, out loud. So she stops me and said, whoa, 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 what do you mean Brian made it up? Like, well, she wrote, she wrote to Bryony, the character wrote Atonement. So large parts of it, she made up. So she's like stunned by this. And she says these words that I'll never forget. So she says, the bits in Dunkirk, yeah, all of those bits all made up. So she says, do you mean to say it's not, none of it was real? <laughs> Everybody's silent. No one says a word. And I'm just like... Jenna, it's a work of fiction. None of it's real anyway. <laughs> it was just like this beautiful moment. But the point of this is that she was so captivated by the fiction. The fiction spoke to her at such a deep level. She loved the book so much that the idea that Bryony had made up the Dunkirk sections, which are really vivid, she couldn't kind of process it. It just didn't really, she couldn't actually, you know, in that, the visceral reality of those sections just, I don't know, she, she, the idea that, you know, they're all fiction anyway, but the idea that they weren't real, it just suddenly had this impact on her. She, she threw the book down on the desk and said, that's it, I'm never re reading Ian McEwan again. I mean, it was just fantastic. She laughed about it afterwards, but you know, that's the power of these stories when, when you open yourselves to them. And I said a word just now, which is kind of my third thing. So ideas, perspective, 
And I really should have written this all down before because it would have been much better to structure it and making it up as I go along. But the third thing is engagement. And this is another thing that I've had a kind of, you know, I don't know whether it's since my dad died or whatever it is, but just a kind of existential re-examination of my life. But um, engage, engagement is just a genuinely powerful thing in your life because I think, you know, in, in terms of what I was saying before, um, about everything's potentially valid. You know, if you go with an open heart, you can learn from every single thing that happens to you. Um, you know, you might learn some bad stuff, but I don't, I don't see it like that. It's just all potential human experience that you can understand the world a little bit better from, or maybe not, you know. Um, but engagement is the key for me. It's, it's how engaged with you in the present moment, right now, with what's going on. How alive are you to what is happening right before you and engaging with the possibilities that that moment brings. That's fascinating to me. And, I, you know, that slide that I was talking about from it being kind of an academic exercise about the books to becoming fascinated with the people's responses to the books. You know, that's very much about watching people come in and um, watching people come in and, and just, you know, they've got an idea already about what they think about the book and they don't want to shift it. You know, they don't want to shift that idea because it's already set and they don't want to engage with it because they've already decided what it means. And my job a lot of the time, you know, probably over the last five or six years has been much more to encourage people to engage, to open up. Um, rather than to stay closed down, which I think is really fascinating. And honestly, that's become something that I've been really interested in myself over the last year, especially when I've been doing, I don't know, just things that are happening to me and a sort of accommodating the fact that my dad died and everything like that and just thinking about life and you know, as my phone rings <laughs> in the middle of doing a video. But I think the point, the point is about engagement is, you know, when you come to a book, um, is are you open to the possibilities that it has before you? You know, if you're genuinely out there and you're reading what the writer says, not so you can judge it, because wait, man, aren't we judgmental nowadays? We want to judge everything and say, this is shit, I don't like this, this is okay, this is a book for women, this is a book for men. You know what, screw that. Just open your heart and just read what's there and just engage with the writer, because the writer's just a person sharing his or her ideas. Um, their own worldview, whatever it might be. And Kerry, Kerry's going to keep calling me. <laughs> and she's like, why is he not picking up? Um, I think the point is, is that if you can engage at a level, you completely surprise yourself sometimes in what's there in front of you that you're not, when you're closed down, you're just not prepared to see it. Some of the greatest classes I have had over the last sort of 10 or 12 years or whatever it's been, have been books that people really didn't want to do or they weren't enjoying because we have to like something to get any benefit of it, don't we? Have to like it. If I don't like it, then I can't enjoy it. And then that means it's not very good and I don't want to experience it. Oh my God, we're so consumers nowadays, you know? Screw liking it. You might learn something that really touches your soul or it might really tell, say something about your character. If you're just prepared to engage with the damn thing, I'll give you a really good example. A couple of years ago, I was doing, I was preparing for a class. I'm very serious when I prepare for a class. Always massively over-prepare. So there I am. I'm doing a book that I've done probably 15 times before, but I'm going through all the motions of preparing. And this guy kind of just looks, he's going past me and he kind of looks at my writing. He's like, you know, what are you... Uh, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm preparing for a class. Now, all of my body language and my energy was like, piss off. <laughs> I'm really busy. I did not want to engage with this guy um, because I, you know, I was kind of busy doing what I already done 50 times before. Um, but, you know, so I'm like giving him no signals to connect. And he stands there and he's like, you know, oh, is that so-and-so book? Whatever book it was, I can't even remember. Um, and I'm just like, furious in my head oh just go away man just please you know in my head just go go and then I just caught myself and I just thought wow this guy's just trying to make a connection you know what I mean he's just trying to talk to me um you know this old guy just trying to make conversation you know what I mean and I'm shutting him down I'm just closing him off and I realized how often I've done that in my life and it's like 
you know, it's such a, a shame because you miss so many potential conversations and just things that you can share and that kind of thing, things that you can learn at every moment. So I put my pen down and I'm just like suddenly open to this guy. And so, you know, yeah, we're doing this book. I'm doing it in class. And he comes out with this nugget of information about this symphony that was written about this, you know, um, to accompany this book at some point later. And he tells me about the composer's life. And the point is not about the content. <laughs> You know, it wasn't necessarily about the content, it's about we share, and it was really fascinating, and I was fascinated in him and what he knew. I judged this guy to be kind of not relevant, and this guy had all this information that I just, you know, I, I, he, it was just sitting there waiting to be shared with somebody, and I was closing him down, you know, I didn't really want to know, and man, that made me think about how often I've done that in my life, you know what I mean, just, just making a connection with someone, just you know, sharing your commonalities or whatever it might be, just sharing something you know, you know what I mean? Um, so that's another thing about books. So ideas, perspective, engagement, just having a spirit that just want, is curious about the world. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, it's fascinating. I meet people every day and they already know what they think about everything. They've decided what they think about everything in the world. There's that, you know, some, and I'm talking about really bright people that have zero curiosity because they've already got it sussed out. And like, you know, social media algorithms that give you what you already know as well are just feeding this kind of like, you know, endless cycle of prejudging everything. And you know what? I was that person. I'm like totally guilty of that over the last sort of, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, you know, thinking that I was very clever. Um, you know, just totally kind of up my own intellectual ass about so much stuff. And I've been really fortunate. I don't know if it took my dad's death to, to make me see that. And it was a slow burn in epiphany. But, um, you know, it, I, I've just managed to get out of my <laughs> backside and just like, just start actually connecting with what's going on and stop prejudging it. And, um, you know, start living in the moment a bit more. I know Simon Hathaway is watching if he's still watching, we'll probably, uh, I don't know, maybe he'll be nodding about that. But um, so that's kind of three things. I'm probably going to end up doing lots of videos because the minute I stop this video, I'll be thinking about other things I should have said. So that's like a, you know, ideas. What's the point of studying literature? What's this point of, of reading these books that I read? What's the point of talking about them? Ideas, just full of ideas that you might never have come across. Perspectives perspectives on the ideas that you might never have come across but also perspectives of human point of view as well you can live in someone's head in a book that you would never be able to do because you're you you're always going to be in here aren't you and suddenly you can step into a man from germany 60 years ago and just feel what that life was like for that person um I find that fascinating and engagement as well, you know, having an openness, a willingness to read a book that you might not want to pick up. This is really interesting. The amount of times that people come to me in class and say, I would never, I mean, and people are really, really <laughs> forthright about it. I would never have picked this book up. Thank you so much for bringing it into my, um, you know, attention for, for, for getting me to actually engage with it. Um, you know, uh, because, somehow even in a tiny minute way because I don't want to get kind of like you know um, pretentious about it but in a tiny way you might just get a little tiny bit of growth somehow you might just understand the world it the, the world isn't your point of view <laughs> it's like it's probably mine or Tony Marden's but it's not you know what I mean it's not it's not our point of view. It's the, the world isn't like we think it is. It's much bigger than that. And any chance you have to just step outside of your kind of egocentric way of seeing it, it's just beautiful if you think about it. If you can see it, if you're a man and you're pre-alpha and you're out there and you're thinking you're a king of the world and you read a book about someone, let's say you read Villette about a woman that's not very pre, that doesn't have any means, but she's really passionately vibrant and she has this amazing inner life, that might just move you just slightly in terms of your in, in terms of your ape egocentricness. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Um so my list, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna really go through this and just think and just tell you why these books I why I love these books basically and just what you know some of the things and I did not prepare this, so this is gonna be a bit rough. So first on the list is Remains of the Day. I've done this book probably 25 times in class is 
a fantastic book to do because people think oh my god it's just a book about a butler i actually had some people i took over a class from somewhere else and from someone else and um the, this was on the list and one of the people in the class came to me and said you know what we've got this book remains of the day on the on the list and a lot of the class don't want to do it because you know it's, they don't think it's you know they've read a few first few pages and it's just about a butler talking and i said okay just you know i'd luckily done the book a few times and i was like just give me give me the first week if you don't like it after the first week we'll take it over but just give me the first session and they and we ended up doing three weeks on that book which was just absolutely fantastic remains of the day is ostensibly about a butler he's older times are changing his job is you know probably um you know it's 1956 and his job's out of getting out of date it's becoming out of date and 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 you know, it's, it's just about him and his thoughts. I mean, how freaking boring is that? Well, turns out not very, because again, if you want to engage with it, turns out it's really fascinating because this guy is going through his life and he is, um, there are large flashback sections in the book where it goes back to 1923, 19, 1923 to 1932, it's this period of nine years. Um, as and and it's it's the brilliant thing the literature does it's it's the microcosm and the macro and the macro so you've got him and his life as the head butler of a really busy stately home and he's got loads of staff that he's controlling and then they get a new housemaid or whatever she's called and it's miss kenton and he she's younger than him but she they're attracted to each other and their relationship grows over the, over a period of time you've got that story develops so he's thinking back about this you got that story developing at the same time that you know um you know britain and germany are talking about the first world war there's lots of diplomacy going on as you lead up into the 30s and you get the kind of rise of nazism so you've got these two threads going on but stevens is thinking all about this he's recreating it all in his mind and he's he's reassessing his life because he came down on the wrong side of certain things he sided with certain kind of nazi slants even though he didn't really want to you know, I'm going to even stop right there and just like just just check in with it. You've got the idea of duty, you've got which you know I think is not a word that we use very often, but some of us still kind of in, in, you know encounter it in our lives about what we should do, things we think we should do. Do we have a duty to anybody? That's a fascinating question. We've got the idea of individual agency. I, do you have free will, and how much free will do you have? The start of the book is, Kajua Ijiguro is such a subtle writer, it's all in between the lines. So the start of the book is something like, it seems I will be going on a, tr on a trip. This is what sparks his, Stevens' is, um, thinking about his life, is he, go, he leaves the house, he leaves, leaves Darlington Hall for the first time in years, he actually goes on a trip. Um, and he says, it seems I will be going on my journey. And even that right there, he's not even sure if he's going to go because he has to ask permission to leave. The book's about agency. It's about how much do you control what you are you are you in control of what you're 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 doing in your life? And that's not an answered question. It's just a question that we see Stevens in, in, encountering and we see Stevens grappling with. But that question is also reflected to us as well in literary fiction. I really think it is. You know, I don't think we, I think some people want to come to books and kind of just, you know, leave themselves out of the book and they just want to come make a judgment about the, the issue. But actually that question is looking at you too. How much agency do you have in your life? That's a genuinely interesting question for every one of us. Later on in the book, um, Stevens meets, Stevens gets mistaken for a gentleman. This book's about identity. He goes through thinking about his life as a butler, trying to justify through rhetorical questions, trying to justify his life as a butler and why it's right to go into service. And later on in the book, he meets a guy called Harry Smith in a pub. They mistake Stevens for a doctor, a gentleman, um, and he doesn't tell them that he's actually been a butler all his life. And he meets this guy, Harry Smith, generic English name, Harry Smith. And Harry Smith is labor movement, free will, you know, don't be a slave, think for yourself. And it's this fascinating meeting between them. I'm, I'm just realized I'm doing a Geller's. I don't know why I'm doing that. Sorry, it's a Freudian kind of slip. It's a fascinating meeting between the classes in a way and between the old view, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of subject nature, a deferred kind of power, if you like, through Stephen. It's like going into service and serving 
the aristocracy. At one point, they, the, the aristocracy kind of brings Stevens in and take the piss out of him, which is really painful. Um, and Harry Smith, who represents the new view, which is all about kind of like my individual free will. I mean, if that's not enough to get you reading that book and just to see how you match up with it, I just, you know, to, to, to let it ask questions of you, then, you know, OK, fair enough. I understand. Um, the next one, The Great Gatsby, one of my favourite books. I mean, who doesn't have some kind of sense at some point in their life of meeting someone that you really love and not feeling good enough for them? I know Tony, Tony Modern won't have this, but um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like everybody's had that um, feeling of feeling inferior at some point. Well, Gatsby, um, this young guy, James Gatz, who's not, who's not Jay Gatsby yet. He's a poor guy. He's, he's a soldier. He's gone into the military. He wants to change his life, but he wants something better, but he doesn't know how to do it. And he meets Daisy Faye, this rich, young girl who has this life and you know this rich life and he's completely attracted to it and completely besotted with the life and her um but they can't be together because he's too poor so he goes off for five years and that's his inspiration she's kind of like his business muse if you like excuse me and he goes along and creates this wealth and creates this um this life of extravagance to impress her i mean not all of us do that but you know, certainly we all have that feeling of, um, you know, as I should imagine some of us have that feeling of wanting to be better, you know, wanting to be better than we are and trying to improve it. There's a fantastic line in in the, in the Great Gatsby where um, Nick Carraway, who is the narrator of the book, um, tells how Gatsby and he, he makes friends with Gatsby and... Nick's driving with um, Gatsby one day and, and, uh, and Gatsby's talking about meeting Daisy again after five years. Now he's rich. And he kind of talks and Nick says, but, you know, you can't repeat the past. And Gatsby turns to him and looks at him and says, of course you can, old sport. Of course you can. And, and that's the thing. That's why Gatsby's doomed from the start. He was trying to recapture something that happened five years ago. He's still, Daisy's ceased to become a person or ceased to be a person to him. She's kind of like an ideal and this is where beautifully Fitzgerald weaves that personal narrative of Gatsby and Daisy and, and Nick into a wider conversation about the American dream, which is an ideal, um, you know, which millions of Americans have aspired to through history. Is it real? Is it just an illusion? Um, this is what amazing writing like this can do. Um, Atonement is on my list, number three. Um, you know what, Atonement is a fantastic book. I've already mentioned it earlier on. It's just a brilliantly constructed, beautifully written book. But just one thing out of that, I mean, you know, the book's about a character, a young girl who's about 13, who makes a massive mistake and makes a massive misjudgment. And that misjudgment causes someone to be sent to prison and ultimately um, die um, in the war uh, without marrying or having any more contact with the woman that he loved and 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 her him as well um who was the character's sister and she she spends her whole life trying to atone for that mistake now who doesn't have some currency with that who doesn't understand at some level that um you know the pain of making a mistake and owning it and realizing that you really screwed up and you hurt someone and you spend your life trying to atone for that in some way, whether it be direct atonement in, you know, trying to trying to make, you know, build bridges with that person, or if it's displaced into something else right the way through li your life. I, I, it always makes me wonder how many really charitable people are trying to make up for some really bad screw up that they had earlier in their life. You know, um, it's not going to be everybody, also, obviously, but you know, I'm sure some people will feel like that. Um, the next on my list is Catcher in the Rye. Um, you know, Catcher in the Rye was published in 1952, J.D. Salinger. Um, I did a class on it about 10 years ago and people were very, there were some people that had read it in 1952 as kind of 17 year olds. Um, and they came to it in later life and it didn't affect them in the same way. They didn't have the same response to it because of all the intervening years and which is quite interesting in itself. Um, but Catcher in the Rye is, was, a, was a, a, a groundbreaking book. It, you know, it brought this, this teenage character, Holden Caulfield, um, and his internal narrative out into a pub, kind of public 
um, reading, if you like. Um, and, and Holden is, you know, Holden's about 17, I think, and he's dealing with the death of his brother. It's not explicitly kind of talked about through the book. It is mentioned, obviously. But, you know, he has this kind of huge trauma because his brother's died and he wasn't there to save his brother. Um, he couldn't help him. And because of that, he wants to be the catcher to that saves the children if, if they run off a cliff. And, and this is kind of the, the metaphor for his life. Um, again, who, who of us does have some kind of issue that we can engage with on that level around that? Um, the next one, Villette, one of my favorite books. Everybody loves Jane Eyre, but my Charlotte Bronte is Villette because it's just such a strange book. It's such a modern book. It's such a beautiful, strange, compelling narrative of this young woman, Lucy Snow, who for some reason that we're not really sure about, doesn't have a home and is looking for something and ends up in Brussels, ends up in, in this kind of uh, fictionalized Brussels that is Villette. Um, working as a governess, um, you know, getting through with her, her, her French um, just about and teaching these kids. And, you know, on the outside, she's plain. She doesn't have any money. She doesn't have position. She doesn't have family. She has nothing. And Charlotte Bronte understands what that feels like to be kind of marginalised and excluded on, on the outside. Um, and, you know, she writes so fully into it that it's just, you can't help be touched by, you know, be touched by it. You know what, a modern editor would probably cut about 100 pages from it, but I don't really care. Um, <laughs> it's just such a, such a fantastic book. She leaves parts of it translate, untranslated in French. It's almost as though um, Lucy Snow is trying to kind of to like retain control of her story because she's had no power in her life. Um, but the thing about the book, it's not even necessarily about the story. It's about the inner life that Lucy has that nobody sees. People on the outside just can't see it because they judge her by being plain. They judge her because she's got no means. They judge that, you know, she's got no money. They judge her because she's a governess. Um, and, you know, they've already prejudged the situation. They've already prejudged who Lucy Snow is. Um, but she's really fascinating and Charlotte Bronte just captures her. She's mysterious and she's interesting. And again, you know, we've all struggled with, you know, trying to define ourselves or trying to express ourselves or trying to kind of, you know, for someone out there to understand who we are. Um, and, you know, again, I, that's a fascinating thing for me. Um, Stoner, brilliant book, not about a pothead. No, stop it. It's John Williams wrote this book um, called Stoner in uh, 1961, I think. It wasn't one of his most popular books. Hello, just doing a live. Um, uh, I, I don't think at the time it sold particularly well, but it, um, it's a slow burner and it's become a kind of modern classic. Um, and it's just about this guy, this ordinary guy that's from farming stock that goes to university and um, he goes to agricultural college and then transfers into doing a, a, a kind of humanities English degree and it's just all about all about his development and his kind of stoicism in the face of the stuff that life throws at you and how he learns about life and the nuances of how he learns about life and, and um, you know, how he learns about love and he's never, he, he, he understands that his relationships that he's been through, he, he thought they were love, but they weren't love in the way he, he comes to understand it later in his life. Um, what else have I got? Tender is the Night is another Fitzgerald. Revolutionary Road, there was a film made about it. It's a very powerful book. Um, let's get to something here. Frankenstein. So many people <laughs> know Frankenstein because it's a narrative, you know, it's, a, it's, it's become part of our culture and it's become part of our culture because it was a really interesting story at the time. When people read the book, they get really fascinated because um, it's, like a, it's like a Russian doll narrative. There are kind of narratives within narratives within narratives. So you get the kind of narrator on the outside and, he, and then he reads letters and then he reads letters within letters and it's really quite interesting structure. But about a third of the way through the book, maybe halfway through the book, um, the, the monster starts to speak, <laughs> speaks really articulately about how he's, you know, been created and he's been left by his kind of parent. Um, and, you know, he feels really aggrieved about this. So it's really a real shock for people to read this articulate um, monster where we see this kind of Frankenstein monster <laughs> all the time. Um, 
and you know it's a it's a really interesting early narrative about about otherness you know about this this monster that's that's created and then kind of left and cut adrift and completely treated abominably um and there are these kind of really interesting questions within the book about you know who's the real monster is it frank is it dr frankenstein or is it the thing he creates um you know there's so much to talk about in that in terms especially now that book written 200 years ago i do believe it was published in 1818 um you know that really speaks to some of the stuff's going on now about ethically what we can potentially create um with the genetic genetic programs and all that kind of stuff um what else have I got on the list? Huckleberry Finn. Okay, Huckleberry Finn um, is regarded as one of the great American novels, and I totally understand why. Twain wrote Tom Sawyer um, because, in a kind of Dickensian way, he wrote these great stories. You know, it's an adventure story about this young guy, but very similar to Dickens. Twain had this side that he wanted to write serious fiction. He wanted to write a moral book. He wanted to write something that was, um, you know deeper more philosophical and almost straight away after he finished writing tom sawyer he starts writing huckleberry finn um and the huckleberry finn's completely different type of book it's very much about huck's internal narrative huck is um this young lad that's not educated he's about 13 or 14 years old he's not educated um and he he's not able to critique his society and Twain never falls into the trap of allowing Huck to be older than he is or wiser than he is. Huck's just a lad but Huck's got something really interesting about him. Huck has a deep friendship with one of the slaves, Jim. I think, I think it's Jim. Goodness, I've forgotten. Um, but he has a real love for this guy. They are properly good mates and and yet Huck knows that his society is telling him that Jim um, is a slave and Jim's property Jim shouldn't be engaged with so when they run away when they when they escape and they try to get away Huck has this brilliant internal narrative going on where he says you know I'm a sinner I'm I'm an evil boy I'm going to hell because I'm helping this man I shouldn't be helping him everything I'm doing is wrong and he kind of goes on and on about how he's doing all these wrong things and then um, says but I'm going to help him anyway because he's my friend I mean, God almighty, if that doesn't get you, and again, you know, it might not be the same situation, but how many times can we relate to a situation like that where we've, we've, you know, the bond of friendship has been, has been greater than some of the kind of social norms or whatever it might be, other judgments from other people, whatever it might be. Um, we've all, we can all talk about that in some way, you know, we've all got some kind of exchange or engagement with that issue. Um, you know, I'm not going to get through all of these, but look, I made a list of, of, of things to, to talk about. I mean, you know what? I don't know how long I've been talking, but it feels like about three days. But here's the point. Um, there is a point. Um, there's a passionate point about understanding what life is. Um, you know, we can just go through the motions of being entertained um, and, and getting stuff to fill the space of our lives. Um, and if that's what you want to do, who am I to judge? I'm absolutely no one to judge because that's perfectly fine. But for me and for a lot of people, we, we understand that there's more to life than what we are ostensibly given. Um, and it's in every moment, potentially, if you're aware of it. And it's, it, there's so much that we can learn from. And we have a great store of, of, of literature through history, which... We don't, it seems to me as a culture, we've stopped regarding, we've stopped kind of like delving into it just to get some kind of like little bits of wisdom here or there. We want to judge it as old fashioned or we want to judge it as not politically correct or whatever it might be. And instead we'll read our Facebook stream or whatever you call it, our Facebook um, post list. What's that called? Your feed. <laughs> we'll read our Facebook feed and that's where we get our wisdom from now. And I get it, you know, some of the stuff might be, you know, I talk about Vanity Fair a lot and I get Vanity Fair is like written in 1948, 1948, 1848. And the content of it, some of the content of it is out of date. I get that. But if you prepare to engage with it, you see that those young people, those young sassy people that are engaging with each other and all trying to have sex with each other, even though Thackeray can't write that, they're all out there. Um, doing exactly what we're doing. They're trying to live their lives. You know, they're trying to tell their stories. Um, 
you know, they're just people living. And I think that's really, really fascinating. Um, so <sighs> the point of this video was to answer the question, what's the point? And um, I don't know if I've done it. I've, I think I've had a good go. Um, there's much more to say and there's many more books I could talk about, but I'm going to have a rest because uh, I've been talking for about <laughs> an hour, I think. Um, but you know what? You know, even if it's not books, it, books is my thing and I'm not saying books needs to be your thing, but it's just stepping outside of your own mental patterns. You know what I mean? We, we can be so fixed in the way we see the world. Um, things become so naturalized to us that we can't see outside of that pattern. And, you know, that's, obviously we can't. But having the willingness to try is really, really interesting. Having the willingness to just step outside, to pick up a book that you might not have read before, um, that you wouldn't necessarily pick up. That's, as I said before, that's why people come on class a lot of the time, come to class a lot of the time, because, um, you know, I'll feed them books that they won't have read or, or, or and they certainly, you know, they might not have picked up before. And if they, if they, even if they came across it, they wouldn't pick it up and read it. And suddenly they read it and they're changed by it. Not in a kind of epiphanic way where they kind of like, you know, huzzah, <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Just nuances, just something that made your experience of life just slightly richer because you see the world in a slightly different way. That's a fascinating thing. Um, and you know what? That's the point for me. And, you know, I hope I've, talking about 500 miles an hour, I hope I've made some inroads into answering that question of, you know, passion for books. I get it, but what's the point? <laughs> All right, so take it easy, everybody. I'll probably shut up for a while. Um, so uh, see you next week. Take it easy.